So we're going to start our unit of study now on the Supreme Court. And to do that, uh, I, 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 I'm i going to do an interactive activity. And I, I, I recognize, uh, I, I don't know how this is going to go over with this class uh, since it's asynchronous, but uh, we're going to try it because I think it's, it's, it's kind of fun and uh, you might learn something. Well, never you, you will learn something. So uh, let me get this fired up. So this is called Life in a Box. This is a, uh, I took a, a class over the summer through Emporia State University, and I, this was a teaching technique that was uh, presented to me as, as an alternative way to get things across uh, and, and hopefully enhance your learning experience. Uh, so if you, I mean, I, I'd really appreciate it if you, I would honestly, if you sent me an email with your honest opinion about how this went over in an asynchronous type of format, uh, I really would. No hard feelings, I promise. So this is life in a box. This has to do with the Supreme Court. So see if you can guess who this individual is. So, the first clue. I was born into a French refugee family living in colonial America in 1745. My father, like his father, was a New York merchant. My parents had ten children. I was the sixth of the seven that survived to adulthood. Later in my life, I would become involved in the American Revolutionary cause. Anybody know? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> no, <laughs> let's move on. Clue two. As relations with Great Britain worsened, I was thrust into the political arena. I did not favor separation from the British crown, as some of my colleagues did, and believed we could work out our differences. I found out how wrong I was when I went with the continent with the delegation the Continental Congress sent to the court of King George III to present the Olive Branch petition in London. Nothing was going to change between us without a war. And this is King George III, and this is the response to the Olive Branch petition. Clue three. I served as a delegate to New York State's convention upon my return and helped write my state's constitution. I became Chief Justice of the New York State Supreme Court and later President of the Continental Congress in 1778. So it should maybe, maybe, maybe be getting a little easier as to who this person is that has to do with the Supreme Court. I worked tirelessly until 1794, serving my new country in a variety of roles. I was minister plenipotentiary, that's like an ambassador, to Spain during the Revolution and served as secretary for foreign affairs while we were under the Articles of Confederation. And this is actually, that I wanted to point this out to you, um, it's a historical curiosity. I found while researching this, this was, and I'm not going to say who he gave it to because that would give the whole game away. Uh, this was George, this is a piece of George Washington's, a lock of George Washington's hair that's in here. And uh, he gave his hair, a lock of his hair, which is what people did back in the day as a remembrance uh, to this individual as he was uh, and his wife were departing to serve as Minister Plenipotentiary, and um, later on, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it was his descendants that had it made into a, a pin, and his initials, GW, or you can still kind of see it on there. It, it, that was interesting to me, anyway, but I am, if nothing else, a nerd, so. Clue five. In 1789, our first president, George Washington, appointed me to be the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. 
while I achieved greatness on the bench, I was unhappy with the limits of my power. I retired as Chief Justice and was elected and served for two terms as governor of the state of New York. Who am I? Well, this this would have worked, I know, so much better if, if this was a synchronous class and I could ask you all these things in person. But I am John Jay. John Jay, again, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He led the way in uh, developing the court and is responsible, as we'll get into during the lecture, uh, for many of the rules and um, responsibilities that the court follows even to this day. So he's an important guy to know about. When we talk about the founders, I know we, we kind of gloss over him, but... Not in this class. Don't worry about this. This these I don't I had to do this for the assignment for my class. You don't have to answer these questions. Certainly there's stuff to think about if you look at them, but uh, I'm not these are not points. This is not an assignment. Okay, so don't worry about this. So again, I, I wouldn't mind some feedback on that if uh if you if you uh, cared to give it. Uh I I I'm not sure how that went over with you all, but uh, anyway, the Supreme Court. So we're looking at Article 3, definitely remember this, for the constitutional authority. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So the judges, both of the supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall, at stated times, receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. So this is a lifetime appointment if you get on the Supreme Court or the federal bench. You hold your office during good behavior. Now, good behavior... Uh, is a, a phrase that is open to much interpretation as to what exactly that means. Um, but most judges don't are not brought up on, on charges of bad behavior. That's a very rare thing in the grand scheme of things, considering how many federal judges and Supreme Court justices there have been in the history of the country. And they get paid, and their pay doesn't, diminish so they don't, they don't get a pay cut during their time in office so it's a decent gig if you can get it so the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this constitution the laws of the United States and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority to all cases affecting ambassadors other public ministers and councils to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state, laying claim, claiming lands under grants of different states, and between a state or the citizens thereof, and foreign states, citizens or subjects. So wh what cases can the Supreme Court hear? Where is their judicial power? ambassadors, public ministers, councils, maritime jurisdiction at the Admiralty, all the cases where the United States is being sued. If, say, Ohio and Kentucky got into a fight about something, they would get it arbitrated in the Supreme Court or a federal court between, like, Ohio and a citizen of Ohio, between citizens of different states, um, and so on and so forth. So here it is. Affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, those in which a state shall be a party. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction, meaning you go there first. That's where you go. That's where you take it. Um, in all other cases, before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, meaning that you work it your way up from the circuit or trial court depending on what you want to call it, to the appellate court, 
to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court has uh, a secondary jurisdiction. You can go to the Supreme Court after you've heard, after your case has been heard in a circuit court or an appellate court or both, you can apply to be heard by the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court, it's important to note, well, before that, it's important to note that this will probably make an appearance on the test. Um, the Supreme Court doesn't have to hear any case at all that it doesn't want to. It's not like Illinois. Illinois, the Supreme Court has to hear cases having to do with the death penalty. The Supreme Court isn't bound by any constitutional obligation. They can pick what they want to hear. So the trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury. Uh, such trial shall be held in the state where the said crime shall have been committed, but when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as this Congress may by law have directed. Okay, pretty self-explanatory right from the Constitution, Article 3. So we get into treason. Now, there is a defined definition of treason. This is to be convicted of treason. You have to have two witnesses testify to the same act that is treasonous, or you have to confess yourself in open court, confess to what you did. Those are the only two ways you can be convicted of treason. So what might treason be? Uh, giving away our troop locations to uh, North Korea or Iran or another enemy. Um, selling state secrets uh, to another country for some sort of reward, uh, spying, things like that. This can be considered treason against the United States, and when it is. Uh, so, but to be convicted, two witnesses, or you have to confess. This is a rare thing. I mean, it. I can I can only think of just a, a handful of treason cases in our entire history. So Congress has the power to declare what the punishment is for treason, but the treason and the punishment stops with the individual. So say I commit treason, the punishment and all that, and when I die, it doesn't go on to affect my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and so on. And that's a throwback to uh, older times when you know, say if you were a duke, your title might have been taken away and your lands were stripped and then your family in perpetuity was forced to live uh, as paupers and build it back up. That's not what they wanted over in the New World. So this lady here, since we're talking about treason, her name is Tokyo Rose. It's easier to say than Eva Toguri de Aquino. Uh, she's convicted in 1949 for treason against the United States during the Second World War. Was pardoned in 1977 by President Gerald Ford. So her story was she visited Japan and got stuck there when World War II began. She wasn't the only one, certainly. Uh, so to support herself, because she was stuck there, there was no way to get home. There was no way to get back to the United States. She took a job as a DJ for Radio Tokyo, where she played music, in a, a quote, to quote, punctuated by banter that was either playfully entertaining or a deliberate attempt to undermine the morale of U.S. troops. So how I've taken that is she made them homesick. She made them not want to be there. She made them not want to uh, fight. Now, whether she actually did these things is uh, a matter, again, for considerable debate. So 
she came home um, to a great deal of public outcry. They weren't happy to see her. Uh, she went to trial. Soldiers reported real memories of, of very damning statements she had made over the radio. Um, although the U.S. Army said her program never hurt morale, the FBI said that her program might have helped improve the spirits of the troops, but she was found guilty of treason uh, of speaking into a microphone concerning the loss of ships. Sentenced to 10 years in prison, she served six. So the nickname here, Tokyo Rose, might not even have been referring to her. She might not have actually even done anything, uh, but feelings were running high. We had lost a great deal in World War II. People, as they often do, are, were looking for a scapegoat. and Well, she was kind of it. But this Tokyo Rose moniker, this might not even have been her that had done it. Uh, because there were a bunch of, I, I don't have an exact number, which is just, you'll have to settle for a bunch of English-speaking women that were on Japanese radio during that period of time. So, this is going to be the end of the video lectures for week 9. Uh, we're going to get back to John Jay in week 10. So, thank you very much.